part of this plate tectonics series. Plate tectonics is one of my favorite topics. And what I'm going to be doing today is connecting plate tectonics with the dynamics of the Earth and Earth's interior. So there's a lot of um, interesting patterns that we see uh, from the surface expression of plate tectonics. This is a map that you'll, many of you will be familiar with. This is the observed plate motions for the present day. And what is shown here in colors is the velocity of each point on the surface um, relative to the average velocity of all plate, which is um, a few centimeters per year. So the pattern that you see here, which is just an exam one example of a few patterns that I'll be talking about today, is that the um, plates that are subducting, which are mostly in the Pacific and Indian Oceans, are moving about two times faster than average. And all the other plates, which mostly have continents on them, are moving about half as fast as average. So that's one example of a pattern, of a surface expression of plate tectonics. You can see on the surface, I'm going to relate that to the dynamics of the interior. I'm also going to be talking about something, a new, uh, new uh, metrics of plate tectonics that I'm just developing. Uh, Called, I'm calling them net characteristics of plate tectonics, and I'll explain what that is um, in the second half of the talk. Before I do um, start the main part of the talk, I wanted to give some uh, credit to my collaborators here. Most importantly is um, Joost van Summeren, who I've been working with um, very closely. He's a postdoc here at the University of Hawaii, and unfortunately he couldn't be here today. But, <coughs> but um, he did a lot of the work that I'll be talking about in the first half of the talk. And in fact, he made this figure and several other figures like it. Okay. Um, the other people, Carolina Lithgow Berloni, Tron Torsvik, Bernard Steinberger, they also contributed to parts of the, um, of the talk. And in, in the second half of the, of the talk, this is uh, work that I did last year in, um, in Oslo. Okay. <coughs> Um, I just, as an aside, I wanted to uh, note that this is 50 years that plate tectonics, since we've, since plate tectonics was really first proposed. In 1962, this, this um, paper by Harry Hess, History of Ocean Basins, is largely considered one of the first papers um, about plate tectonics, and that was 50 years ago. So, um, in some sense, we can think about what we have learned about plate tectonics since it was first proposed. And some of my talk will get in. Uh, we'll uh, address those issues. OK, so I'm going to be talking about the driving forces of plate tectonics. And ultimately, we kind of know the driving force. And this has been known even before plate tectonics uh, exist, before plate tectonics was proposed. These are some figures by a paper by um, Holmes, 1931. It was talking about convection in the interior of the Earth. Convection is a process whereby the, um, the hot material at the bottom of a fluid is moved to the top and cooled off there. And basically, that is the driving force for plate tectonics. It's the ultimate energy source that drives the whole system. And in this paper, you see some flow patterns and some connections to surface expressions of uh, links to geology and things like that that are similar to what, um, we, how we think plate tectonics works today. So that's something to keep in mind. What are the specific driving forces that connect this convecting interior to the actual motions we see at the surface? Okay, and so <clears throat> This is a topic that's been discussed over the past decades. And there's some major, for, uh, major plate tectonic driving forces. One of, the, one of the best papers about this topic is by Forsyth and Uate in 1975. And they make this nice cartoon of a plate and, um, uh, and the forces that are actually exerted on that plate. Okay, So I'll talk about a few of them today. One of them is uh, FSP, slab pull. Slab pull is just the weight of the slab dangling into the mantle. And that, that slab is cold, so it's dense, and it's sinking. And it pulls the plate. There's a, if it's connected to the surface plate, it'll just simply pull that plate into the mantle behind it. Okay. Uh, F, drag force. And you'll notice this is listed as a driving force and a resisting force. 
drag force here is the connection to the convection in the interior. So if the mantle is flowing in the interior, it's going to push on the on on the it's going to push on the plate above it and push it along presumably towards the subduction zone and away from the ridge. But if the slab is pulling strongly on the plate, it's going to drag that over the mantle. So that could be a, a resisting force as well. Uh, there's others. One um, that's talked about a lot is ridge push. The ridge is elevated here. And so the, it's kind of a gravitational sliding. It wants to expand out. And, and that tends to exert a push force on the entire plate. And then there's others, continental drag, continents stick down deep into the mantle. So they're going to export, experience kind of a different drag than a thinner plate might, and I'll talk about that. There's other resistance forces. If you have a mountain that's built up as a result of collisional, fluid, uh, collisional plate collision, then that can um, exert a, a, a resistance. And um, similarly, if there could be resistance along the transform fault. So I'm actually not going to talk about um, most of these today because these are, uh, let's see, uh, most, many of these transform resistance, colliding resistance are specific only to specific plates and I'm going to look in a global frame. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to just go through the major driving forces very quickly and get a brief estimate of just an uh, order of magnitude estimate for the ma relative magnitudes of each one. Okay, so let's start with ridge push. Ridge push, you can compute this by calculating the difference in the pressure as you move down through the mantle, say a column at the ridge compared to a column away from the ridge. And you integrate that all up and um, that gives you a difference in pressure. So this is all mantle, which is denser than the average of water and lithosphere. Okay, so the net, there's a net pressure pushing this way compared to a pressure pushing, pushing that way, and that gives you a net force on the plate away from the ridge. And if you compute this, and this is done in Turcotte and Schubert, um, you get a ridge push force of about 2 times 10 to the 12th newtons per meter length of ridge. Okay. Okay, let's compare that to the slab pull force. Slab pull force, you can easily add up the excess weight of the entire slab as it's, um, of, of the excess weight of the entire slab in the mantle. And you just uh, multiply that out. And you get, for upper mantle slabs that are 50 million years old when they subduct, we get about 3 times 10 to the 13 newtons per meter. So it's about an order of magnitude larger than the ridge push force. And then finally, basal tractions. We can get that, we can estimate a basal traction as <clears throat> a viscosity times a strain rate in the, uh, in the space beneath the plate. Strain rate you can get, just get from a difference in velocity between the plate and what we think the mantle, the mantle is moving. So if we assume a velocity of 10 centimeters per year accommodated over 150 kilometers and a viscosity of 10 to 20 pascal seconds, integrated along the length of a plate, say that's 5,000 kilometers, we get 10 to the 13th newtons per meter. So, <clears throat> in general, these two forces, the slab pull and the basal tractions, are about an order of magnitude bigger than the ridge push force. So, one thing we can do is con to consider <clears throat> the plate motions, the link between plate motions and mantle convection as expressing a balance between these basal tractions on the base of plates that resist the motions of plates or in some place may, might push the motions of plates <clears throat> and the gravitational force on density heterogeneity within the mantle and to a large extent that's the slabs in the mantle so this is kind of a simple picture of that balance a more complicated picture would be um, this and this is a numerical model that I've developed um, in the past couple of years of mantle flow in the interior of the earth connected to surface plate motions. Okay, so this is a cross section across the mantle, across the Nazca and South American plates, across there. And you can see the Nazca slab sinking into the mantle. That's driving the circulation that then pushes on the base of the Nazca slab, and uh, Nazca plate. And so this is kind of a more complicated picture than, um, <coughs> than I 
than I showed you before, and it expresses the 3D heterogeneity within the mantle and the 3D patterns of velocities within the mantle and so forth. But there certainly seems to be a connection between this convection cell beneath the Nazca plate and the motion of the Nazca plate, which is riding on top of it. Okay. One other thing to note is that the slab pull force, I considered only the upper mantle portion while calculating the, the magnitude of that force. But you can see there's a lot of heterogeneity in the lower mantle that also contributes to the, to the large scale flow pattern. So it's, you can't just think of this as only um, slab pull driving the system. Okay. So now let's get back to our observation that I showed you on the first slide that the subducting plates, which are mostly in the Pacific and Indian Oceans, these are the red arrows, are moving about three and a half times faster than the overriding plates, which is all the other plates, and they're mostly continental. Okay, so we have kind of two ways that we can think about this based on the, uh, based on the discussion I just, I just talked about. I, we can have a hypothesis that these plates are subducting, so they have slabs attached to them, and that slab pull force is driving the plates driving the subducting plates faster than all the other plates. Okay, so these are moving faster because of slab pull. Slabs are pulling. Another alternative hypothesis, which has been pro proposed by several people, is that the, um, <coughs> that the continental plates are slowed by their interaction with the mantle beneath them. And so the continents presumably stick down deeper into the mantle than the oceanic plates, and they would have a larger basal drag on them as a result. Okay, so we'll investigate two, these two possibilities. Okay, <clears throat> let's talk about slab pull first. So we can estimate slab pull for all the subduction zones around the world by just calculating the mass of slab that's in the upper mantle. And we can, uh, this is, uh, um, we can do this easily from a data set by Lalamond et al. Okay, but we have to consider the possibility that the slabs might be detached in places or maybe the slabs aren't strong enough to support their entire upper mantle weight. And if you calculate the upper mantle weight of a really thick slab, that might be up to 5 times 10 to the 13th newtons per meter. Divide that by a thickness of 100 kilometers for the thickness of the plate that's subducting, you get a stress of 500 megapascals. And that's really at the upper limit of what we think that oceanic lithosphere can support in terms of um, its strength. So this is an integration through uh, it, sorry, this is an estimate of the, uh, the strength in terms of how much differential stress can be supported, and it gets up to, a, up to about 500 megapascals. Uh, this is from Pulse Editor in 1994. Okay, so if there's some, <coughs> some weakening, or if, if the entire weight of the upper mantle slab cannot be supported by the plate, then we could say that this estimate of the pull force is really an upper bound. And maybe some part of this pull force is instead of being supported from above by the, by the connection to the subducting, uh, by connection to the sur surface plate, it could be supported by viscous stresses on the edges of the slab or from below by the, the high viscosity upper mantle. Okay, so we, we say maybe there's some weakening. So we have to take that into account. <coughs> Okay, and then, um, okay, I'm going to compute basal tractions, and I'm going to do that using the uh, mantle circulation models that I showed you before. Okay, so we have um, the input to these models is the density structure of the mantle, which we can infer from seismic tomography. And this is from uh, Ritzema et al.'s seismic tomography model, and you can see the slabs in the mantle. This is a cross section through across South America, but in other parts, of the mantle, say across Africa, there's a big low velocity anomaly, which we could, in, one interpretation is that's a, um, a, pe a part of the mantle that has lower than average density and it's rising and driving it up well flow. The output of these models is the pattern of mantle flow. And from that, by integrating the stresses on the base of the plates, we can estimate the driving force, the, the basal traction, the force on the base of the plates. And this, in fact, is the tractions that are predicted by that model. So in a place where there's a downwelling, say near South America, the slab is sinking there, 
and the tractions are convergent upon that location because the mantle, mantle is flowing towards that location. It's pushing on the base of the plates, pushing the plates towards that location. In places such as Africa where there's an upwelling, it pushes the plates away from that. So that's, so that's where you see the, um, the arrows point going away from, from that location. And the colors here represent the magnitude of the tractions. All right. <clears throat> so another thing we can do with these models is change the thickness of the, of the lithosphere. So we can have, for example, a layered viscosity lithosphere in one case, or deeply penetrating cratons in another case. And that, these are the two mantle tractions that you see. And the pattern is very similar. The directions are very similar. But one thing that's very different is the magnitude in the cratonic areas. So here's South America again. It's convergent upon this location here. But you can see that the magnitude has increased. It goes from yellow there to red there, which is a factor of more than two increase in, uh, in the amplitude of the traction. So if you have deeply penetrating cratons, they're more well coupled to the mantle flow. So the tractions are larger. Okay, and one, one way we can look at this is, um, is by taking the ratio of those two fields that I showed you before, and you can see that the mantle tractions are larger in the cratonic areas by a factor of um, more than two. Okay, so now <clears throat> we can think about the link between plate motions and, um, and plate motions and mantle flow using these models, and it really depends on the rheology that you assume for these models. So, we've talked about the coupling between the slabs and the subducting plates. So the slabs, this is the slab pull force. If there's, it really depends on how strong the slabs are. Can they support the entire weight of slab in the upper mantle, or is, some, is there some part of it that might be disconnected or supported by other parts of the system? <coughs> Alternatively, you can think about the coupling of mantle flow to the surface plates. And that really depends on whether or not there's a low viscosity of the sphenosphere here that might decouple the plates from the mantle flow to some extent, or if some parts of the plates are protruding deeply into the mantle where they're more well connected. So neither one of these are well constrained. So I'm going to use both of these as um, kind of unconstrained parameters in, uh, in, in the models. And we'll see which, which uh, if we can actually use the plate motions to place the constraints on these. So the way we're going to do this, and this is some um, work that Yost uh, did, and it's based on a method that was proposed by Lithgow, Bertoloni, and Richards um, in 98. And it's the torque balance approach, where you take, um, <coughs> you basically balance the forces on each of the plates, and you do it simultaneously for all the plates around the globe. So first you drive mantle flow using mantle flow models like I've um, shown you before. Or, and you estimate the slab pull forces. So you have an estimate of all the tractions on the base of the plates and all the slab pull forces. Those are all the driving forces. Okay? And you, ask, and you calculate the torques that those forces exert on each plate. Next, you do an experiment where you have enough, uh, you can just have a viscosity structure in the mantle without using uh, the, any driving forces in the mantle. And instead, you impose a, a force on, the, on each plate individually in each different direction. And <clears throat> so you do an experiment. You move the plate, and then that drives the mantle flow in the base of the, uh, underneath it, that then exerts a torque on all the other plates. And so you get kind of the response of, <clears throat> you, get, you get the response of the mantle to that motion of that individual plate. So you can measure those would be, in a sense, the resisting torques to, uh, to mantle flow. And so you, then you just balance the driving forks and the resisting torques, and you can invert for the motion of each plate. It's just an inversion problem. Okay. So let's do, uh, I'll show you several examples that work, and then we can talk about which works best. Okay, so this is, these are the observed plate velocities that I showed you before. And the ratio between the driving, the uh, subducting to non-subducting plates is, is 3.5. This is um, a model without an asthenosphere. So basically you have the stiff plates and then a less stiff upper mantle and a less stiff lower mantle. Okay. And 
you can see that if you have the slab, slabs, and this is including slab pull, pull slabs pulling 100% of their possible value. <clears throat> if you compare these two, the fit looks pretty good. We're predicting a plate velocity ratio of 3.2 and a misfit parameter, which basically is the average vector difference between all the vectors in this map compared to all the vectors in that map. Okay, you can say, well, how would this change if I were, say, instead of allowing each slab to pull with 100% of its maximum possible value, to instead allow, only allow it to pull, say, 50% or some fraction of that maximum possible extent. If we do that, this is how the slab pull, uh, this is how the um, plate speed ratio changes. So it increases to a maximum of this 100% of 100 slab pull. Okay, and to a value of three, about 3.5. The misfit also gets worse as you go towards smaller slab pull fractions. And the reason for this is that when you have smaller amounts of slab pull, then you have, then the, the, the subducting plates don't move as fast relative to the other plates, so they slow down and, every, and this ratio gets, work, uh, gets farther away from it, it's a reserve value and the misfit gets larger. Okay, so this is without an asthenosphere. Let's now add an asthenosphere. Okay, and this is, now I'm, uh, you can say follow the red or the orange curves uh, in, these, in these graphs. And now I'm showing you a comparison with only 50% slab pull. So that only half of the upper mantle slab weights are attached to their surface plates. And if you do that, you also get a very good fit with about three and a half times the um, observed uh, the observed plate speed ratio and an even lower misfit. So this model seems to work just about it, pretty much as well or better compared to the, um, the model without an asthenosphere. And the reason that 50% slab pull works when you have an asthenosphere is that the slabs then don't need to pull as hard on the subducting plates in order to speed them up to their observed value because there's not as much resistance beneath those plates to that faster motion. Okay. And now let's consider the case where you have deep roots penetrating into the mantle and in, into the mantle flow. And when I say deep roots, that means they're going all the way through the asthenosphere into the upper mantle. And if you do that, <clears throat> then the, the mantle flow, this more sluggish mantle flow, tends to start slowing down your plates. And um, you need even less slab. It starts to slow down your, uh, sub your overriding plates with continents on them. And you need even less slab pull in order to match this plate speed ratio. So we have three models, one with deep roots, one with um, either shallow roots or um, a layered viscosity, but with an asthenosphere, and one with no asthenosphere. They all seem to give pretty good misfit and pretty good comparison to this plate speed ratio. So you could say, well, the plate motions don't really distinguish between them. There's one thing you can do is to um, estimate an upper mantle viscosity for the, for, if you estimate the upper mantle viscosity to be about 3 to 6 times 10 to the 20 pascal seconds, um, <clears throat> that's a number that comes from estimates of mantle viscosity associated with post-glacial rebound then you can distinguish between these three cases because the no asthenosphere case predicts plate motions that are too fast with using, if you assume a viscosity in this range. I'll give you, uh, and, and before I go on, I should say that the way to look at these figures is this is the absolute plate velocity magnitude in colors, okay? And that's the observed case. Compare that to the, with the same colors, the no asthenosphere, the prediction from no asthenosphere using this plate balance approach. And you can see that the Pacific plate, Nazca plate, all these plates are moving with speeds of almost 20 centimeters per year when we, when we observe them to be about half of that. <coughs> and similarly, the overriding plates are moving too fast too. If we go to the no continental, the deep continental roots case, then all the plates move too slowly if you assume viscosities of this magnitude. And, and so you can see that here by the colors for the deep continental roots case. 
the shallow continental roots. And when I say shallow, I mean they don't penetrate into the upper, upper mantle. There's a low viscosity of steam sphere beneath them. This seems to give a reasonably good fit to the, uh, the, the uh, observed magnitudes of plate motion. Okay, so let's just sum what we have so far. The major plate driving forces seem to be slab pull and basal tractions. And the slab pull, uh, in particular, slabs are only partially coupled to the plates with about 50% of their upper mantle weight. And this speeds the subducting plates <coughs> relative to the overriding plates. Um, basal tractions are also important to the force balance. The plate motions are coupled to the mantle flow beneath them, but through, but that, that coupling is modified through a low viscosity of sphere. And that partially decouples, in particular, the cratons from the mantle flow. So in this figure, I've purposely drawn a low viscosity zone beneath the cratons because they're partially decoupled through that low viscosity zone between them and the mantle flow. Okay. Now I'm going to switch gears and talk about net characteristics of plate motions using some of the knowledge we've gained from the first half of the talk in which we learned that plate motions are intimately connected with the mantle flow patterns. So <clears throat> this is a picture of um, from the plate tectonic reconstruction of Torres et al. to 2010. Um, what I'm hoping you can see here is that this is the 0 to 10 recent times. And these are the outlines of the plate. So um, this is the African plate, South American plate, North American plate, and so forth. And so we're familiar with this pattern. And what I just showed you is that this pattern, through slab pull and basal tractions, is connected to the mantle flow in the interior. So now we can ask the question, well, what about the, pre what about the previous plate tectonic, re earlier reconstructed plate motions from, say, this te plate tectonic reconstructions and other ones have, um, have shown similar patterns? <clears throat> For example, here, and just to keep you thinking, I've colored the different plates at different times in different colors. So here you can see South America is almost the same color, but Africa has changed color. There's no reason for that, except that it was easier to make this map with our uh, random assortment of colors. <coughs> the Pacific, for example, here, the Pacific plate is moving west here, but in this reconstruction, at 50 to 60 million years, it was moving more north. There's other plates in the past times. This is the um, Farallon plate, subducting so beneath South America and North America. Here's the Kula plate. All of these plates had different geometries and different uh, directions of motion at these past times. And you can go farther back, or Torsvik goes farther back in time, 100 to 110 million years. You can see some, see the Pacific Basin was significantly different with three major plates <coughs> that are, that are um, expressing the different patterns, different patterns at different times. And if you go farther back in time, the Pacific Basin was even larger with maybe four or five big major plates. Okay, so what we can ask is, since plate motions are intimately related to the mantle flow beneath them, can we use these different expressions of plate motions at past times, for which we have some geological information, to learn something about the mantle flow at these past times, for which there's very little geological information? Okay, so I'm going to do something that we'll try to get at it to learn something about the mantle flow at these past times using something I'm going to call um, the net characteristics of plate motion. So you're already, I think in this class, you're already familiar with one net characteristic of plate motion, and that's the net rotation of the lithosphere. So <clears throat> expressed in an average sense, at least in some plate tectonic reference frames, the lithosphere is rotating about a point in the South Indian Ocean about five, or in the HS3 Griffin Gordon reference frame, it's rotating about almost five centimeters per year in the direction of Pacific plate motion. So this is a net rotation of the lithosphere about this point. Okay? <clears throat> and here you can see I've drawn, drawn a cartoon of that net rotation of the lithosphere. Now let's think of another one, which is something that you don't normally consider, and I'm going to call this the plate tectonic dipole moment. So this is actually very simple also. 
And think about, think about it as if you took the velocity vector at each point on the surface of the Earth and added them up into a single velocity vector. Okay, so, <clears throat> say the, uh, so some, some velocity vectors, say from the Pacific, would partially cancel ones that from a plate moving in a different direction, say uh, Asia is moving towards the, towards, the, um, towards the east a little bit, that might cancel with North American motion towards the west. So those, those two plate motions might cancel to some extent. <clears throat> but in an average sense, the plates are converging or moving in the direction of this minus point here, which happens to be located in um, North Korea. And they're moving in an average sense away from this point near South America. So you can think they're all converging on South Korea. Some people, uh, when I give this talk, some people suggest that maybe that's the reason that North Korea is so paranoid about things, <laughs> is that they have all these plates converging on them in an average sense. But, <clears throat> but um, so this is another net characteristic of plate motions that you can think about the net, that, where are they net converging towards? Okay. <clears throat> now let's look at the net characteristics of the driving forces, the plate tectonic driving forces. Now we talked about slab pull. This is the Lalamond et al. Um, data set, which I, uh, uh, Actually, I wrote Wu and Conrad. We did uh, an analysis of this slab pull force in this other paper. Um, if you calculate the net slab pull dipole moment, you get a net convergence around that point in Asia and away from that point in the South Pacific. Okay? So on average, the slabs are tending to pull their plates towards this point. Now, let's think about the dipole moment of the basal tractions that mantle flow exerts, exerts on the surface plates. And what you find is that on average, the basal tractions, which are shown in uh, arrows here, are driving their plates towards this point north of India and away from this point in the South Pacific. Okay, so. These are similar patterns. In fact, these are the dipole moments of the three vector fields that I showed you. Plate motions in black, basal tractions in green, slab pull in blue. And what you see is that all three of these points are approximately co-located on the surface of the Earth. And this is, in a sense, another expression of the interrelationship between mantle flow and the surface expression of plate tectonics. So what, <clears throat> what I'm hoping is that we could use, we can, we can make this measurement of the dipole moment for, for plate tectonic reconstructions of past times. And um, so, so it's a simple calculation to calculate how that point's migrated in time. And I've done that for torus vex plate tectonic reconstruction and what we can do can look at it, how it changes with time, and I'll show that, you that in a moment. But before I do that, I want to talk about one final net characteristic of plate motions. And this is a slightly more complicated one, and I'm calling it the plate tectonic quadrupole. And a lot of you might not know what a quadrupole is if you've studied, um, if you've studied uh, <coughs> aspects of the, the geomagnetic field, you know that there's a, a quadrupole associated with the um, the Earth's magnetic field, but um, I'm going to be talking about a plate tectonic quadrupole. And what that is, is <clears throat> a net motion of, it's easier to show on the cartoon, a net motion along from, from a positive pole towards a negative pole about a zero pole. Okay, so you can think about this as if this were a ridge going all the way around the Earth, and this were a subduction zone going all the way around the Earth. Then, and, and you had motion from the ridge towards the subduction zone. That would be the net character, that would be the plate tectonic quadrupole. And so I can calculate the locations of these different, lo 
of these different poles, and there's three for each quadrupole. A plus, a minus, and a zero. Okay. Okay, so this is the plate tectonic quadrupole for present day plate motions. It moves from this point near the East Pacific rise towards the, uh, near the Marianas with a lot of subduction. So that kind of makes sense. You're moving from a region of extension, of a lot of um, extension towards a region of a lot of compression. And, but another component of it is moving away from this location near Africa towards subduction here and also towards South America where there's a lot of subduction. Okay. So these are the locations of the plate tectonic quadrupole. Now, what about the, uh, how are they related to the quadrupole moment of the mantle flow field or the slab pole driving forces? And what you find if you do that, you apply, the, if you calculate the quadrupole locations for the basal tractions and the slab pull forces, that they're almost exactly co-located with the locations of the quadrupoles, quadrupoles for the plate tech, for present day plate tectonics. So <clears throat> mantle flow is divergent. So this mantle flow would be expressed by the basal tractions in green. Those are green. And those are showing the loca locations of divergence, convergence, and um, and motion about the zero poles um, that are almost exactly co-located with the plate tectonics. Similarly, a slab pole, as shown in blue, has almost the same co-location. So this um, is not an accident, I would argue, that it's the this, this plate motions are simply expressing the surface expressions of mantle flow, which at, at these high order, high order degrees, such as um, the quadrupole or the dipole, and so what I'm going to do now is look at how the locations of these quadrupole and dipole change with time to see if we can see how mantle flow might have changed. Okay. I'm also going to, before I do that, I'll um, just mention that the divergence poles, the plus poles, are located above the two major upwellings in the mantle in the present day. So this is a figure showing the, man, the vertical velocity from my mantle flow model at 1,000 kilometers depth. Red is upwelling and blue is downwelling. And you can see that the south, the, most of the Pacific has upwelling. Most of the, uh, mo mostly near Africa you have downwelling. And so the two major upwellings are occurring right over those locations of the plate tectonic, the, of the divergence poles of the plate tectonic. Now I'm going to look at the time dependence. This is the plate tectonic dipole as a function of time. To look at this, you go from the present day in North Korea toward backwards in time through the different colors of the rainbow. So you start with red, and you go towards orange, and then green, and yellow, and so forth, and blue. And, um, and then by blue, you're back to 200, 250 million years ago. Okay? So, this plate tectonic dipole has migrated with time, but mostly around East Asia. It's mostly stayed there. And I'm, I would argue that this represents the um, relative stability of subduction, that the major subduction location as a function of time is occurring in the Western Pacific, East Asia region. This is where Tethys subduction was going on and present day uh, subduction. Of, uh, of the Pacific as well. <clears throat> now I'm going to talk about the quadrupole time dependence as a function of time. So we, again, we start with red and we move through the rainbow. So um, this is the current location. As you go backwards in time, you see uh, that the location of the divergence poles has not migrated too much. Similarly, the location of the uh, convergence poles has not really migrated too much. Now we go farther back in time to 90 to 150 million years ago. The divergence poles are all still South Pacific and Africa, but the convergence poles has migrated between Antarctica and Alaska. So we, that's changed. And now, if you go farther back in time, 150 to 250 million years ago, the divergence poles have moved. Uh, convergence poles have moved a little bit, but divergence poles are still located in these two locations. So looking at them all together. 
you can see that the, converge, the divergence poles approximately remain co-located about above these two upwelling zones in the mantle, but the convergence poles uh, pivot around these two locations. So they pivot between Alaska, North, North America, and then East Asia. Okay, so I would argue that these two, this is telling us that these two locations in the mantle represent stable upwellings, and then the system, the, sub, the subduction on the other end of the system, migrates around them. <clears throat> okay, so we can say that this represents stability of, of welling structure. Like, uh, surface pivots about upwellings beneath Africa and the South Pacific. And there's other evidence from other um, studies, and maybe um, Tron Torsvik will talk about this next week, that, um, that these two locations in the mantle represent relatively stable locations. One thing that um, uh, Tron Torsvik observed and collaborators is that the, many of the plumes that we observe originated at seem to have originated at locations that are right above the edges of these, these two locations. And this, these two uh, upwelling structures have been called a deep mantle anchor structure by Jawanski et al. EPSL 2020. So I would argue that this quadrupole analysis uh, supports these arguments. <clears throat> okay, so I've come to my conclusions. Plate motions are driven by both slab pull and mantle flow in the mantle interior via basal tra tractions on plates. The link to mantle flow allows us to use plate tectonic net, net characteristics to characterize past mantle flow. And in particular, the dipole moment tells us about the stability of Western Pacific subduction. The quadrupole tells us about the stability of the African and South, South Pacific um, upwelling structures. And just to conclude, I am going to um, show you a movie, and this <coughs> movie will give you an idea of where we can go from here, potentially. If, these, if, if, the, pla if the mantle flow system really is stable about these two upwelling systems, then those upwellings would represent um, stable locations about which the continents are moving uh, as they move across the surface of the earth. So in some other work we've talked, I, um, I've talked about how upwellings tend to ri rise the surface of the earth, maybe up to about a kilometer, and downwellings tend to pull the surface of the earth downwards maybe about a kilometer. On it. Um, and then a lot of the topography we see on top of that is isostatic topography associated with density differences near the crust. And um, so this is called dynamic topography. And so if this is true, then, then this pattern of red, blue, red, blue would be approximately stable as a function of time, and then the continents move over this pattern. And if, um, it, it, so this makes a prediction that, that as, say, South America migrates west, it would move over a, a, low, a low part and then start to move up over a high part as it moves, uh, moves on to this stable upwelling. And it, in most continents, it would tend to move away from this high associated with the African upwelling. And so I'll just end with a movie that shows how, those, how the, um, the plates have moved as, as a function of time relative to this predicted uh, topography map. <clears throat> and so you can see this is, this is uh, Pangea breaking up. And that's where I'll conclude. Thank you.